degree in electrical engineering and computer science from the University of California, Berkeley. Dan Wu is a senior director of system engineering at Marvell within the company's automotive business unit. With a history of working in the semiconductor industry, uh, Wu is skilled in automotive electromagnetic, electromagnetic compliance, um, signal and power integra integrity simulation, and real issue resolving, product life cycle management, and test automation. Prior to joining Marvell, um, Dance worked as a design manager for Maple Optical Systems and a hardware design manager for Light Telesis. He earned a Bachelor of Science and Master of Science in Electromagnetic uh, Theory and Microwave Circuit from Tsinghua University in Beijing. So welcome and uh, the stage is yours. Thank you. Thank you for the introductions. Um, good morning, good afternoon and good evening to everyone. Uh, welcome to our presentations about uh, enhancing high-speed Ethernet transceiver electromagnetic immunity performance with artificial intelligence. So in these presentations, the world we'll talk about uh, automotive Ethernet in general, or we'll talk about the EMCs, the requirements, concern, and we'll, of course, focus on the next generations, the EMI mitigations before we go to the Q&A sessions. Okay, so automotive Ethernet. So today and the future autonomous vehicles requires highly reliable in vehicle network to deliver on the need for the massive, <coughs> excuse me, amount of data communications to, on the extreme environment conditions, such as the with stringent uh, or very strong electromagnetic interference. This ever increasing need for very reliable and high bandwidth is driven by the new trend, such as uh, artificial intelligence, machine learning for data processing, time-sensitive network, securities, and also the, the smart power distributions over data lines to, uh, for minimized cabling. So here's on this page, we show one of the typical uh, futures to uh, use case of the young vehicles network. We can see on the edge, uh, there's the various uh, uh, sensors like LIDAR, radar, saunas, uh, of course, image sensors. So data will be collected and eventually passed to the CPU, GPUs for processing through the Ethernet network. Um, so the network consists of the the Phi uh, bridge and the Ethernet switches. So the link uh, speed uh, between uh, Ethernet port varies depends on the bandwidth requirement of the applications and also depends on the topologies of the network. So we can see uh, it varies from gigabit to multi gigabit and even beyond the 10 gig in the uh, near futures. So one of the, the issues to, to deal with today in order to reliably to move the data around within the vehicle is to uh, uh, deal with the EMC uh, issues because car is moving around and environment changes the, the, um, when you have the different location. So before we talk about uh, uh, the source of the EMC problems, so we probably can uh, review uh, what changed in the last 10 years, which actually is to the, uh, create all this the demand or the new requirement uh, for the EMC uh, issues. The first is the safety concern. Uh, we all see the IDES and the AD provides the more convenient and safer drive experience. For example, the EU has a goal to reach zero fatal or serious uh, injuries down European roads by 2050. So it requires faster, reliable, and a low latency network to move huge amount of data around. So I believe that a lot of the, the uh, car manufacturers has even higher 
uh, bars to or the sooner to achieve that goal. And also today's the vehicles are constantly connected. So telemetrics and wireless communications are widely used in a vehicle, which requires the even higher level of the EMC control, right? <clears throat> like V2Vs and uh, the, all this uh, uh, communication within and uh, between the vehicles. And also there's concern about the global warming. Uh, uh, it's translated to the less weight requirement or less uh, fuel consumptions. Uh, as the examples, the single pairs, the Ethernet solution is preferred today. Um, in addition to the cabling, to the weight reductions to also influence the ECU design in multiple aspects. For example, right, the, the weight of the chassis or weight of the, the ECU enclosures, materials, and, and those are actually the more or less related to the uh, the thermal performance, the EMC performance, and so on. And also the the the, the changes are about the new technologies. So IP and the Ethernet are becoming the mainstreams of automotive the technology today. So we have the LTE, Wi-Fi, GPS, Bluetooth, digital audio, digital video. Those extend the frequency range from 400 megahertz to over six gigahertz today. <clears throat> so <clears throat> on the signals, the vertical wise, so we can see the EV and uh, uh, HEVs that use 200 to 800 volts high voltage batteries that within the vehicles, which means that the, we probably will see the, the higher level of the noise the, when the engine starts or something the happening to the, within the vehicles. Okay, so those are the, the, the change for the, the past years. And meanwhile, the electromagnetics interference, the source are, uh, are around the, the, the vehicles when we move the car, right? So those the externals, the, envir the environment also is contributed by the uh, internal system. Uh, externally, we have, the, for example, we have the radio towers, we have the power transmission lines, we have airport radars. Those actually is the, will generate the noise and uh, which require the vehicles able to uh, tolerate. So internally, still we have the, the engine, uh, we have windshield the wipers, we have mobile phones, we also have the infotainment system. They all electronic device or controlled by the electronic device, which will generate the noise. So potentially, is the, the interference to the source as well. Right, so uh, I think it's been uh, many years to the uh, all the, the semiconductor suppliers, to the tier ones, the OEMs, they need to deal with the uh, EMI issues from the different levels, components, ECUs, vehicles, for example. Um, the, the, the real concern is all this electromagnetics, the noise can corrupt the uh, intended signals. And as a result, the electrical system susceptible to the EMI can malfunction, which uh, lead to the safety concern. And also increasing signal spectrum makes the receivers more susceptible to the large range of the noise. Uh, in the past, the, 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 you transmit the 100 megabit or even gigabit, your bandwidth is very limited and you may not really is interfere with the GPS signals and vice versa. You probably do not care a lot of the high frequency components. Now that we move to the multi gig and eventually it's the beyond the 10 Gs, all the noise that is the more visible right, or harmful to the, to the real signals we intend to trans, transmit. And also the, the EMI requirement evolves to along with the technologies, right? So the, for example, semiconductor nodes get uh, kept in you know, a shrinking. So 14, uh, 7, 5 nanometer. Now we're talking about 3 nanometers. And it translates to the smaller, to the swing of the signals. And uh, the device wise is more susceptible to the uh, external noise, which was may not be the, the bigger issue in the past. 
Okay. Uh, meanwhile, the cost optimizations limit the expensive the system level options, such as the fully shielded ECU or the channels. Right, so there's the, the trade offs the, the, uh, between the performance and the cost, the always. Yeah, there's the multiple ways to deal with the, the loss of the data uh, today. Uh, on the high levels, uh, there's the way uh, used, like a, in general, is the retransmit. Uh, for, ex for example, Ethernet to use the TCP IP protocols to ensure the success of the data transfer. But this uh, technique may not be suitable for the time sensitive or mission critical automotive applications due to very long round trip delay and also requires extra bandwidth. So I, I think the people familiar with that uh, probably have that numbers uh, uh, in mind now, right? So we probably take uh, worst case can be 40% bandwidth just consumed by this to the round trips handshake. Um, okay. So the, with that, I, we believe uh, it is essential to meet the standard of five bit error rate requirements uh, at the five level for data transfer uh, with stringent EMC requirements. Um, of course, to the, on the extreme conditions, the uh, phi or the Ethernet device may lose the link. So which actually is to the, uh, create even more uh, consequence, right? Uh, more severe consequence to, because to the, the loss of the link will create to the uh, multiple layers protocol issues. So the ability to maintain the leak is also very important. It's not the, the it's more important than to keep the, the, the data integrity, I would say. Okay. So the, to deal with the EMC issues, the, the, there's one well appro approach is like a top down. So people look at the system levels and they're trying to uh, attenuate the noise, uh, as the examples, but the, uh, besides the cost concern, whatever you do, there will be always the residue of the noise to um, be visible or exposed to the EMC transceivers, which we need to uh, to deal with. Um, and also the the increased uh, the, the bandwidth of EMN noise to place the additional stress on the system design, right? Just let's say the the uh, for example, the, the passive component on the PCB today may be sufficient to have the bandwidth to support 100 megabit or gigabit. But once we go to the more than gigahertz bandwidth uh, for multi gig and beyond the 10G, those components may not be qualified. Then we need to look for the uh, better components and uh, that's translate to the higher cost. And also the, uh, uh the like a real estate uh, uh the space uh, other concerns too so we believe the most economic ways to solve the issue is on the silicon level if that possible okay so the balance act between emi performance versus the overall system cost we just talk about that and the other things that we've been dealing with on the emc issue is the design that is sufficient for today may be outdated by the tomorrow. So because the, 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 all this technology, the, the evolving and requirement change, which requires the, 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 uh, the files be able to keep up with that in terms of dealing with the, the EMC issues. Okay, so the, we, we, we placed all the, uh, the requirements and issues to reach to the phi EMC control. Now we talk about how to deal with that, uh, the, the concern, right? What's the, the future generation the, the, the phi device can do? So we, we, we believe that it is the K to keep current EMI mitigation relevant under evolving environment and technology to enhance system safety, right? So I think the key word here is the evolving environment and technology is not just to deal with the existing issues. 
So be able to adapt and mitigate the noise when needed to prevent the data corruptions. So I think there's another keyword here, so adaptations here. So we able to do that. So the, one of the solutions is to enhance the EMI performance through artificial intelligence. Uh, when we talk about the AIs, right, the so people say, why, why you have to use the AI? What's the benefit and what's the difference, right? So when we look at the, the, the AI, we think, you know, the, uh, like uh, the machine or let's say transceiver, right? <laughs> or the internet device to, to, to solve the issues as the human beings, right? Humans to sees the, the, sense the data and then identify or classify the, the problems and then solve it based on the past experience, if you already learn. Yeah. Or we actually try to the best uh, the attempt to deal with the new problems. The result can be good, and then we learn. Right? We put that in our brains, in our database, so next time we, we can do it faster, quicker, we can react. And if it failed, then that's the lesson. So we adjust, so next time we'll be the more ready. Right? This is the, the, the quite different from the existing the uh, transceiver design, which can just deal with the uh, known issues and uh, uh, is the fixed. If the things change in the future, there's no guarantee you can always the, uh, have the solution. Okay, uh, with this in mind, uh, uh, I was the, uh, the let the cliff to cover the, the rest of the, the, the slides uh, about uh, the details, how we can um, leverage from the, the artificial intelligence to uh, solve the future issues. Cliff, please. Thank you so much, Dan, for the uh, discussion and the background and the, uh, on, the on the EMI issue that we need to resolve. Um, so, um, oops. okay, so we're on the right slides. So uh, in order to use artificial intelligence in, uh, in this uh, transceiver application to really mitigate the EMI noise, just as in any uh, machine learning design, we would want to be able to classify and of course infer the incoming EMI noise uh, and its uh, character, uh, characteristic. And in order to do so, we need to extract the noise feature information, uh, such as but not limited to time varying frequency response over time from the incoming signal. Then uh, through utilization of machine learning, we can then refine and categorize each combination of noise feature uh, to different type of MI condition and thereby able to influence our future changes in the received noise. So the goal here is not just to identify the noise itself, because by the time you can say that we sample the uh, entire waveform and you see the, see the noise and say, okay, this is a, a certain type of uh, maybe from the radar. But by that time, your noise already exists on the, on, you already received the entire uh, duration of the noise. So it's already too late to respond. So in here, we really want the system to be able to see the onset of the noise. And based on that transition, uh, identify the onset of it and be able to react as soon as possible before even observing further, uh, uh, further portion of the noise coming in. So the system has a chance to survive uh, this kind of noise environment. And so how exactly do we classify the noise or more importantly, the question we need to answer for any machine learning uh, problem is that how do we extract the feature sets uh, from this signal for the classification to happen? To do that, uh, we have a, a, a conventional idea of to mapping the uh, time domain signal into a frequency domain image. Let's consider that uh, as the signal comes into the Ethernet transceiver, we subdivide this signal into a window of M sample size. And then we compute the frequency spectrum of this particular window. Through doing that, we can we have the fre uh, frequency spectrum of this particular time instance. And if we uh, play, use, uh, use this frequency, sorry, if we consider this frequency spectrum as a, a column of an image by combining uh, end of this windows, uh, windows, then we have a 
n by n image of uh, n by n pixels. That way we uh, can uh, have a time varying image uh, of the frequency uh, frequency spectrum transition of the uh, incoming signal. And to the uh, to the system itself, uh, it's not only looking at how the uh, how the amplitude of the signal trend, uh, evolve over time, but also how the frequency spectrum or how the uh, so say frequency component of the signal changes over time, allowing more information to be extracted from the signal. And as signal continues to be received by the transceiver, we can then consider this as a series of frequency domain image uh, progression over time, which we can treat this very similarly to as a fetal stream uh, from a fetal camera. And because of that, we can uh, potentially fit it into a conf convolutional neural network uh, for, uh, for processing to extract the feature and determine what kind of uh, uh, noise uh, that may be present on the system. For this purpose uh, of uh, machine learning, strictly speaking, any machine learning method uh, would have worked. However, we specifically choose the convolutional neural network because it, one, it is a mature existing uh, machine le uh, learning algorithm. And two, it is a proven solution in uh, being able to automatically learn the filter necessary to extract the feature from image and video, and they can learn much better than us human can define. So this is the reason why we choose this method uh, and to try to convert the time domain signal into a series of frequency domain image in order to utilize this well-known uh, machine learning algorithm. And with this system, then we can, uh, we will be able to identify and classify the noise that is present uh, to the EMI transceiver and be able to predict uh, any ch uh, future changes in the noise. And this information will be passed on to a dedicated mitigation planner, which will serve multiple purpose, including adjusting receiver, uh, sorry, adjusting receiver uh, setting to remove and uh, attenuate the incoming noise so that we can recover the intended signals. And also on the side, it will continue to, uh, to provide further reinforcement learning as a data set uh, for the using the income, uh, collected data to increase the set of training set possible for, uh, for noise characteristic to uh, actually observe additional behavior for a particular type of noise on the field. And through that, you can also you can uh, we can update the ideal response that the system should use uh, based on the information feedback from the detector and classifiers. So constantly, the system is refining how uh, how the filter should be adjusted, how the system should be adapted to uh, to the environment in order to provide a, to find the best response uh, with to minimize the amount of, uh, to minimize uh, the noise effect on the communication channel. And this is uh, basically how uh, we, uh, the, this next generation of um, EMI mitigation uh, should have uh, should be functioning. And with that, uh, we pass it back to Dan uh, for the overall uh, discussion summary. Thank you, Cliff. Yeah, uh, let's jump to the summaries. To so first, uh, with the advanced uh, artificial intelligence technology, the transceivers continues to learn and adapt to ever evolving uh, environment. That's uh, the one of the key takeaway. And so design is more future proof. And as another benefit, so potentially, so we can integrate a fire into the vehicle level intelligent network to further improve the performance and the efficiency. As we know, the 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 just like a single person is definitely is the, the the can do much less than the team, right? This is similar concept. And as semiconductor technology advances, the implementation will become more affordable because the cost, the powers, the that's the, probably the first question people would ask. So the, to this is the, the we we look at the, the futures 
and uh, the technology advanced uh, so fast on the semiconductor side. So we believe uh, in the very near future, uh, is is will be more affordable. Okay, so uh, this now we end our the presentation. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you very much, Dan and Cliff, uh, for this presentation. Um, we have a we have a couple of questions here, and I start with the first one. Um, this EMI noise mitigation at the file level. Do you forecast any possible impact of this on overall power consumption of the PHI? Probably increase uh, slash decrease. Yeah, that's the good question. So the, uh, the implementation is not the focus of this presentation. Um, uh, we, although we, we do believe that there will be the implication to the increase of the power uh, but that's the multiple way to solve it, right? So the, the technology advanced and also the distributed uh, uh, after the, the workload. So that's why at the beginnings we showed the, the, the INV, IVN, right, in vehicle network, which the, the, the implies that eventually so the, we can leverage the other processor in a different node to help to solve the, the problems. So the, in our experience, the in, inferences the may not take a lot of the power. It depends on the, the, the problems you are dealing with, the set of the problems you are dealing with. So it's the learnings, that part. But the, the good thing is the learning parts can be you know, widely distributed, right? Not only within the net, network. I mean, vehicle network is the, the potentially it can be just the, 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 the amount of vehicles right, from the cloud. That's a good question. Thank you. The next question is, what is your expectation uh, regarding future trends regarding system level ESD, IG contact ESD discharge in view of changed passive components and potentially more ESD sensitive files in multi-gig Ethernet links? Yeah, uh, the, the ESD is the, the, the special case because it has the very high uh, launch energy and a very short period of time, right? So those actually is the, the um, without the, the, the system components to attenuate that, the, you will easily uh, saturate the, the transceiver because the, the, the power supply to the transceiver today is probably mostly 3.3 volt. So your analog may not be able to deal with that, right? Uh, so in other words, you may not be able to capture the, the signatures of the ESD device uh, within the, the transceivers. So those need to be either uh, handled by, let's say, error corrections, or need to be uh, the, handled by the high layers, the protocols. Right? So you probably just lose the one packet as the examples. Yeah, uh, this is from the, the, the power on case right for the damage case i think that's regardless to the we need to the semiconductors the, the device need to deal with that and make sure the device is from the damage um the next question is um the ieee 802.3 bp thousand base t1 targeted uh, utp cabling for the link segment under emc conditions in automotive did Marvell ever investigate to improve emission behavior to ensure unshielded twisted pair cables can coexist with sensitive services such as DAB and TV for frequencies from 150 to 400 uh, megahertz in European markets? Okay, so those are good questions. The, the, uh... <laughs> Uh, it's about the actual device. Uh, I, I, I can try to answer it here too. Uh, yes, the, we, we did, right? So the, uh, the, the problem is really depends on the, how the UTP cable is bundled or placed uh, next to the, another sensitive the receiver antenna, for example, right? So if you go by, Physics, so the, the the theories, right? The, the way UTP can actually is to, uh, have the less emission. The assumption is the far field really is far field, right? So it's balanced. But if you look at the very closely uh, to the cables, the, 
I mean, um, is is not really balanced, right? So, in other words, the you will see the the near field the emission higher than we discussed in the past, like at triple meetings and other conference, right? So that's the different assumption. So the um, uh, it really depends on the user case and uh, the 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 placement of the, the cables. UTPs may not be the the best. Uh, the the current implementation may not uh, the be the best uh, suitable solution right for that. Um, back to the questions that we we do, we actually have done a lot of the the, uh, the simulations on the device and the simul uh, system level, trying to understand uh, what uh, the best uh, the device can do to uh, further reduce the, the common mode noise. The next question is, uh, what was the size of the timing when wind downs to create the frequency domain image? I'll probably leave that question to Cliff. <laughs> yeah, as uh, Dennis mentioned previously, uh, the idea of this uh, presentation was not really a uh, project particle implementation. So uh, in uh, in short, uh, the size of the time and windows to create this frequency domain image uh, really depends on uh, the resolution of the frequency uh, spectrum that you're interested in and how uh, your system uh, uh, receiver is designed to handle the noise. If you, of course, of course, if you want a uh, better resolution, then you will need a larger windows uh, size in order to retrieve those uh, frequency spectrum uh, out of the uh, incoming signals. Okay. Yep. Next question is: uh, What is estimated the additional overhead in implementation compared to classic cancellation methods? Yeah, that's actually the the the. the the answer we are presuming too, right? So the uh, we don't, I don't have the, the actual numbers to the, at this moment, but the the, the uh, general the, the understanding of that is all these are digital. Uh, if you're familiar with the, the fire architecture, you know that the digital just take very small amount of the the, the cost in terms of the diaries in the in the the fire. And also the FI has a lot of the, the advanced features to this, right? You have the, the securities, you have the, the, the functional safety support, and the the to add the, these capabilities, we we don't believe to the uh, all we believe is going to be much more affordable than we thought with the, the technology advance. And there's a final not a final question, there's another question. Would the result of computation be implemented only during link training or during normal operation? It's the continuous the, the, the calculations on the background. Yeah, it's, it has to be. Okay. Um, to what extent will uh, the artificial intelligence impact the FI uh, FW configurations? Um, I I don't have a direct link between the firmwares and the that. So uh, honestly, the, the we are we we'll talk about the, we implement this on the five levels. We try to introduce the least latencies as possible to deal with the real time issues. So I don't believe the firmwares actually is the, has much contribution or impact to that. Mm -hmm. And when does Marvel plan to bring this technology to products? Well, I don't have the marketing guys here, so <laughs> uh, I really cannot answer that. So, uh, honestly, at this moment, uh, we we is uh, the the R and D project. All right, I think that was uh, the final question. Um, mm -hmm. Thanks again for this very interesting uh, presentation at the end of this um, day. Um, yeah, and this presentation concludes not just the session safety, security, and robustness, but also day two of the Automotive Ethernet Congress. And now I wish you all a pleasant evening or day, and I'm looking forward to seeing you again tomorrow at 2 p.m. Central European time. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, yeah, thank you, and, everyone. Uh, a couple yeah. of compliments, well done, Dan and Cliff. I read it uh, a couple of times, so I wanted to share with you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you.
，拜拜。可以拜。